five to a hundred. Fairy tales can come true It can happen to you If you're young at heart For it's hard you will find To be narrow of mind If you're young at heart You can go to extremes with impossible schemes You can laugh when your dreams fall apart with the seams And life gets more exciting with each passing day And love is either in your heart or on its way Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth To be young at heart For as rich as you are, it's much better by far to be young at heart. And if you should survive to a hundred and five, look at all you'll derive out of being alive. And here is the best part, you have a head start. If you are among the very young at heart And if you should survive to a hundred and five Look at all you derive Out of being alive And here is the best part You have a head start If you are among the very young At heart Hello everyone, yeah, that was Gizmo. Gizmo is an amazing singer, and nobody knows that. A uh, few people know it. And th the reason I know it is because um, he has one, he's singing, he sings one song on one album that I heard. I was like, man, you gotta sing more, but he's not pursuing a singing career. But then we decided to, we have two videos like this, and we're making a new one right now. We're gonna do a really nice version of White Christmas, uh, which will be released next month. Can you all hear me? Can you let me know if the sound is okay? So that I know that I'm audible. Okay, great. So I think I'm audible, and you could also hear the video, so I know that uh, that everything is fine. So, but um, uh, watch out for Gizmo. I mean, we we wanted to record a whole album, but the thing is, it's it's a lot of work to do it like this, of course, because everybody's recording at home, and then I have to mix, have master everything, and and I have to guide the whole recording process because everybody's recording with a click. And I mean, it's fun to do, but uh, after making like eight of those videos. It's like, okay, uh, <laughs> it's taken away from my uh, YouTube making videos. Uh, so we decided to not pursue it any further. But, you know, who knows what happens in the future? We might still, uh, we might still do it. So thank you all for joining. Before we start some uh, housekeeping, the first thing is, if you want to ask me a question on YouTube, um, there's two things you can do. The first thing you can do is you can tag me, but you have to tag me exactly with my channel name, which it says Christian uh, space fun space Hamer. You have to do it exactly like at and then that name because that will light up right. Now you can see somebody did that. The thing is, last time uh, I was scrolling after the video and I was like, a bunch of people tagged me, but they spelled my name wrong, like Christian with one A, which happens all the time and I understand it. 
but Christian is a Dutch person. If you do that, it won't light up, and, and I, I might miss it. So that's the first thing. The second thing you can do, of course, is do a uh, super chat. If you do a super chat, it will light up really big, and uh, I'll probably have to react immediately. Um, so that's uh, the first thing. And then the second thing is, um, I reviewed my video of, from last week. I did a live stream. If you didn't see it, it's still up on my channel. And uh, there was a lot of things I could do better, so I'll, I'm going to try to do it better. But the first thing I noticed that I forgot to say the thing that I wanted to say, which uh, got me a lot of criticism, which I will talk about a little bit more. But before we start, I want to make very clear that everything I'm saying in this video, all my opinions, they are just that. They are my opinions, right? I'm not claiming it's the truth. Far from it. It's just my opinion. Just one guy's opinion, it might be completely wrong. In fact, I guarantee you, it is wrong. But if you enjoy just hanging out and just listening, and then you can listen, and if you don't agree, that's fine. We don't all have to agree with each other. And that's the same goes for all the teachers on YouTube. We don't all have to agree. There's many roads that lead to a certain goal. There's many roads, roads that lead to Rome, and my road is not the only road. And I'm certainly not claiming that, that I have the right direction or anything. It's just my opinion because what happened with last video was that I didn't say that because I wanted to say it but then we restarted the video because of technical difficulties and then I just forgot to say it so what happened is I have a YouTube stats app right and I can see in the app uh, from if, if there's an external site which links my video I can see people coming in from that site so there was this forum called jazzguitar.be, which is, a, a, I think, a pretty well-known forum. I never hang out there, but the times I did go there was because somebody linked one of my videos. So they linked last week's video, and a lot of people were very enthusiastic about it, or they, they really liked it. The, the guy that posted the video, I think it's one of my patrons, if I understand it correctly, he really liked the video. But there was also a lot of criticism, and I think the criticism was very, very fair. Because when I looked at the video, it kind of seemed that I was saying, like, what my way is the best way. But that's not true, right? It's just one opinion. Uh, so I understand the criticism. And I want, to, I want to rectify that right now. Right? When I say, like, okay, I don't believe in music, studying music theory, that's just because I didn't do that. And a lot of people that I admire didn't do that. So I, I chose a way that doesn't involve that. But it doesn't mean, of course, that it doesn't work because there's many people that have done that that are great players, much better than me. So that's I want that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, and then for for today's video, so we're going today we're going to look at this video, which I actually got the idea for this video from that forum because somebody posted the link to that video. And what I'm doing right now to to get ideas for videos like this, this live streams, I, I I just game like. I'm gaming, and then meanwhile I'm watching or listening to videos, and then every video that sounds interesting, I, I, I make a list, so I have a list now. But this video is not on it, but somebody linked it and I watched it, and there's some pretty interesting stuff in it. But the first thing I want to say is that I am a great admirer of Rick Beato, and I've been always been surprised that in certain circles people are very critical of him, uh, for instance, in... Uh, Inside my in my university, which I teach, like I hear a lot of people saying that they don't like it, or online, or in forums, or uh, on Facebook, and I, I understand what they are saying, but the one thing they forget, and but it's difficult to gauge that if you don't have your own YouTube channel, that what he accomplished in three years, he's been on YouTube with almost two million subscribers, with a channel about basically music theory. That's just a an inhuman prestation, right? Present, uh, yeah, prestation, is that the right word? Well, it's an accomplishment. It's an inhuman accomplishment to, to do that. Who else has done that? Uh, have two million subscribers in such a short time with an amazing uh, quantity of output and also quality because Rick Biado is, of course, very, very knowledgeable on many subjects, many more subjects than me. I couldn't make uh, three-fourths of the videos he's making. So, as a fellow YouTuber, I admire that. And I've watched many of his videos. Not all, it's not, it's not possible, there's too many videos. But, um, 
the, the next thing is, so we don't all have to agree on everything, right? So I don't agree with everything that Rick says, and I'm sure he doesn't agree with many things I say. In fact, most teachers on YouTube don't agree with what I say, and that's fine, right? We all have our own ways, and they all might work. Some might not work, or some might work for some people and not for other people. So this video is pretty interesting because he makes some interesting remarks about jazz, about learning jazz and uh, jazz and guitar. Now, this is a live stream. And live streaming is, it's difficult to be coherent in a live stream. And I noticed that from last week, because when I watched it back, I noticed many times that I had two ideas in my head and then I didn't finish sentences and I cut myself off and I rushed through another sentence. And then sometimes I sounded incoherent. And that is just the, the, the excitement of live streaming. It also happens to Rick in this video. And that's because he obviously didn't prepare everything he's going to say, like, like I'm doing now, but I have it easier because I can just react to what he's saying. But uh, people are uncritical of that fact, but it's a live stream. When you watch his edited videos, if you watch my edited videos, it's much more coherent. That's because we can edit it. Because if you would see my edited videos unedited, it's, it's really disastrous in its incoherency because I make many mistakes when I talk, I uh, say the wrong word, I speak. I know the thing I'm saying is going nowhere. So I uh, picked out some interesting tidbits from this video. And, but before we start, let me address the questions that have been asked, in which I'm tagged. Guys, if you don't tag me, it's very hard for me to see the question. So if you want me to answer the question, please tag me or um, tag me or do a super chat. Okay. So just my two cents asks me why... Do most gypsy players, including you, so me, mainly play with three fingers and often use open position, especially on diminished? So the three fingers thing is easy to answer. I don't play with three fingers. I actually play with four fingers. But when it's language based on diminished, and that's a lot of my language, of course, because I'm, I come from gypsy jazz, I play diminished with three fingers. That's just because I can do that much faster than do it like this. Because this movement is just much harder. So because we want to play diminished really fast, we do it with three fingers, or we. Stochelo does it with three fingers, and everybody that's emulating Stochelo's fingerings, that we, I call that the Dutch system of diminished, does it with three fingers. And because there's so much diminished in Gypsy Jazz, it seems like we do everything with three fingers. But it's not true, because when I play a more bebop-oriented licks, then... Right, then it's four fingers. Let me put the guitar a little bit louder. So, and the open strings, well, that's just because there's a couple of licks that use open strings in Gypsy Jazz that are very cool, like this one. Right? Or we have the uh, E7 one. Or the A7 one. So those are just licks with open strings, or G7. That's D minor. Those are open strings, those are just standard licks, and that's when uh, we use it when we have an A7 chord, E7 chord, C7, um, G7, D minor, that's it probably. There's maybe a couple more, but I can't think. Oh yeah, and of course G. That's all open strings. Okay, another question is, oh, testing, yeah. What games am I into? Okay, that's... Uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's the last question I'm answering before we start with the video. Um, not, right now I'm playing uh, I'm playing Assassin's Creed Origins. That's because I bought it a long time ago. But then uh, Zelda, I was playing Zelda. I spent like hundreds of hours <laughs> in that game. But I'm waiting for uh, Cyberpunk 2077. But it got delayed, which I have stock in uh, in Project CD Red, so the stock dropped. <laughs> but now it's rising again. Uh, I'm waiting for that game. So then I said, okay, what game do I have left that I didn't play? And it's Assassin's Creed Origins, which is it's pretty fun. But it's like every Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed, it's uh, pretty repetitive, right? But you can you can get kind of satisfaction in making the repetitive thing, do the repetitive thing better and better. Okay, let's start with this video. I have some markings, some time markings, and we're going to start... 
Um, we're going to start here at 3, 3.23. It was, uh, you know, these were common vocabulary for blues, right? Well, in jazz, because you had to actually create a degree program, you had to come up with a syllabus and you had to come up with, with uh, you know, all this material in order to teach this thing called improvisation. Now, improvisation is not really easy to teach. So what they would do is they would hand out a lick page. This is most places. And they would come, there were books like Jerry Coker. and. So he's, he's saying something very interesting. That's something that I heard before and that I thought about many times. He's saying improvisation is not very easy to teach. And that depends on your definition of improvisation. And this is where the difference between my methodology or it's not even my methodology it's it's a methodology that is prevalent in the sinti camps in the gypsy sinti camps which is where i come from right I, i'm not a gypsy sinti i don't i i didn't grow up in this camps but my first exposure to uh playing jazz guitar were the sinti were stochelo uh paulus Moses, of course, um, all those Sinti. I, I, I've been in the Sinti camps many times. I've jammed there a bunch of times. Um, I, that's where I come from. So I learned to play guitar like them, just starting at a later age. And for them, improvisation is not what many people think of. Right? They think, okay, improvisation means in jazz that you have a song and then after the theme, you can do any, anything you want. And some people are capable of, of making great sounding solos s somehow, right? And other people can't. That is a very basic understanding of improvisation, right? If you go one step beyond that, you could say that's probably the, the, the way that most teachers nowadays teach it. It's like, okay, we give you some tools like scales or arpeggios or principles, right? Like, like Barry Harris has principles, right? It's like these kinds of enclosures. Um, pivoting, th that kind of terminology. And then you have to train yourself to use those tools at appropriate moments. That is already one step more prepared than the first step, right? Whereas where it's a, you can do whatever you want. Sinti, the Sinti culture takes it one step further. They don't take skills and arpeggios as building blocks. They take phrases or licks as building blocks. And of course, they're not the only ones to do that, right? That's a whole culture also in, in other styles of jazz that have been doing that. I saw a documentary yesterday about Artatum, and they were talking about devices that Artatum used. So that's the same as yeah, licks, devices, phrases. It's all the same thing. It's like a group of notes that sound nice. So... Sinti start with that, and the way they do it is like this: it's like um, they learn a song, they learn a tune. It, oh, everything is based on tunes. That's also very important. So, okay, uh, today we're gonna learn Joseph, Joseph, right? So then, somebody said this is the first chord, right? They don't give it a name. They, they know it's like if it's a name, they have a name that refers to the shape of the hand in their own language, and then they would say up here on the guitar, right, the fourth fret. They wouldn't even say fourth fret. They say it's, it's here, this shape whatever name it is, here. And then maybe you want to play solo, so then somebody asks, what well, do you play on this? Well, for instance, you could play this. Right, somebody would say that. Okay, and then it would very slowly, somebody would copy it. Until they have it. This is a phrase that they would never change in the beginning, right? Later on, something might happen. But in the beginning, this is something they would play. They would play it all the time. And now you might say, well, but that's a C minus, it's an A minus six, or Pedro uh, Christian. Yes, but that's not the way they look at it. it. That's it's just something they can play on this shape, this shape, which is an A minor chord, but they don't call it that. But I mean, let's call it an A minus six. They can play this. And once it sounds good, then um, the Stochelo might say, well, why don't you try to play something like this? And somebody copies that, right? And that's how you build up your library of licks. And then you start working on your reflexes to play them at the right time, with the right sound, and the right timing, and the right vibrato. And that's where all the attention goes. Like, how can we play this, this little thing that everybody plays, but make it sound really, really good? 
that's why they all sound great because they've been working on that. They they didn't work on learning arpeggios and then trying to see if they can make music with it. They take a phrase that already sounds like music and then they work on the sound and the timing and the technique to make it sound great. And the more phrases they get, the more each independent phrase starts to deconstruct in smaller parts that they can then combine with other parts. It's like learning a language, right? The, the first thing you learn is a, is a whole sentence, and then you learn another sentence, sentence, and then you start combining the sentences to say something completely new. That's how it works. Okay. Uh, let's continue. So he, he has a good point. It's very difficult to practice improvisation if your definition of improvisation is some building blocks and somehow you're going to make them sound some building blocks that, that don't sound good by themselves, but then somehow you got to teach the student to make that sound good. That's difficult. And uh, Jamie Abersold had these play-along records, things like that. And what they would do is they would have these 2-5 licks. When I say 2-5, I mean 2-5. If you're in the key of F, the 2 chord, G minor 7 to the 5 chord, 2-5. And the first thing that they would teach is this. Now, what is that? It starts, it's it's a one bar two five. So on the five chord, it goes to the third. So it goes right up the minor seventh arpeggio to the third of the uh, of the five chord. So that'd be the third of, of the five chords of the root. Right, that's the C. And they would do these things moving in whole steps, okay? So there we go. And they would do that because most two fives move in stepwise motion like that. Or not most, it's very common for it to do. The only thing is, is that that's incredibly corny sounding, okay? And, and what you do is you end up teaching people... They would start teaching people rules of what to play on what kind of chords, okay? So they would say things like, don't play the sixth on the two chord. Don't play the four on the, on the five chord. Or don't play the four on the one chord. They would never say why. They just tell you not to do it. So they would make you practice scales. Like if you're playing a, uh, an um, A minor seven chord, you would play... So he's playing, a, he's playing a scale right there that skips the six, right? He's playing A minor scale that, play, that skips the six because that's an F sharp, of course. And so he's saying they were teaching, okay, on A minor in the 2, 5, 1, 2, G, you shouldn't play an F sharp because that is part of D7. And you want to hear this movement from G. So they started teaching students rules, like don't play the six on the uh, two chord because... That's something that you should save that note for the D7. And one way they would do it is they would teach them licks that had that resolve, that resolution in it. Right? So, the way I look at that is, to, like, the way a, a gypsy jester would look at that is, like, the, the rules don't mean anything to them. But they, they would just think, okay, if I have a 2, 5, to G, there's two options for me. I can either play on all three of those chords... Right? And then, in, indeed, I'm going to play something like, uh, right, that's A minor, D7, G. Or I could skip this chord and just think two, two bars of this D7. And then they would play this F sharp. So instead of thinking about, uh, or th instead of thinking about rules, they would just choose specific chords to play over, so this problem goes away, right? Because that's the other thing, both options sound fine. You can play over all three of those chords, you can play over only, you can play on only the five chord and the one, or you could even skip the two and the five completely and only play on the one chord. If you play coquette, right, it's one, two, five, two, five, one. What you could do is you could just play only on the one chord, the whole thing. One, two, three. So 
So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of trying to make uh, the changes now because I'm playing alone. But if there would be a backing track, I could get away with only playing in D. It's not going to be the strongest solo, but it does work. And that's the way I look at uh, jazz improvisation as well, right? I don't stick to the chords that are presented to me. So that's why these kind of exercises make no sense to me. If this is a great lick for that kind of progression, yeah, that makes sense to me to practice it. So it's a possibility, but it's not to teach myself rules because those rules don't exist for me. Whatever sounds fine. And the, the way I find things that sound fine is through transcription. I see what Django plays, I see what Brady plays, I see what West plays, and I see the chord progression he's playing it on, and then I learn it myself, and I tie it to two specific chord voicings, but there's no rules. Uh, somebody says I have a delay on my voice, is that true? Let's continue. I'm going to answer questions uh, uh, later, guys. So right there I played an A minor 7 without the 6. Okay, so I skipped that note F sharp. I played. Okay, so they make you practice that stuff. Then you go to the 5 chord and you go... Oh, sorry. By the way, Rick Beata is a great guitar player, right? You can't see it maybe in this video, but... He is a great guitar player. Check out his um, improvisations on Instagram. He's great. It's like amazing stuff that I would never be able to play. It's very modal. It's not my kind of thing, but it is great. No doubt about it. And you play that, and then you go to the one chord, and you do the same thing. So I wasn't a jazz major, but I would hear all the other jazz players play these things, and I'd be like, well, why, are they, why are they teaching you this? I learned to play jazz just like I did rock off records. So I would learn my vocabulary um, from people that, you know, professional jazz players, the jazz greats. If it was Wes Montgomery, if it was Joe Pass, if it was Pat Metheny, if it was John Schofield, people that were out when I was, you know, Pat Martino, that when I was growing up, those were the th guys. If it was rock, I learned from Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton and and David Gilmour, and uh, and then I, if it was blues, I learned from B.B. King and Albert King, and and I would learn the vocabulary by learning their solos. And you'd learn, by learning that, you would learn phrasing. But jazz then, at that time, needed to have things. They needed to have a curriculum. And the curriculum led to the lickification. You see, so here's, I think, where some of the coherency problems start in Rick's video, because here is he saying exactly the same thing that I'm always saying. Okay, if you want to learn to play jazz, look at the grades of jazz and start learning their phrases. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying when you want to learn uh, uh, rock, uh, Jimmy Page, Jimi Hendrix, when you want to learn jazz, uh, Wes Montgomery, uh, Pat Martino, for me, the Django also, of course. When you want to learn blues, B.B. Uh, King, uh, Steve Ray Vaughan, he, he's saying exactly the thing I'm always saying, like, just learn through transcription. But then later on, he goes into, like, the building blocks before that, like scales and arpeggios. That's, that's completely not the same thing. So uh, he's right when he says in institutions, like, I teach at a, I, I teach at the University of Rotterdam. Well, I don't teach jazz guitar, I want to make that clear. I teach jazz violin where there's no students. So I work with students in the master department in, in different topics. Sometimes there's jazz guitar players, but we talk about other things. We don't talk specifically about how to play jazz guitar, but it's more bigger things like styles or um, concepts, right? But it's true that when you want to teach that those universities, they had to, they had to develop a curriculum, something that they could put on the front page, like this is what you're gonna learn, right? So like in the first year, you're gonna learn how to play on the blues or something, or and rhythm changes and ten standards. And the way we're gonna teach that is through these meth methods, like these uh, certain licks, these certain skills. And I bet that when they started that, it was kind of uneasy, but because the first teachers that were teaching there probably didn't learn it that way, they learned through copying of records, which is the the age-old tradition. But somehow, this 
it got accepted by students, and now it's the main thing, and it does produce good players. So I'm not saying that, but um, it's not the traditional way of learning this music, and it's not only for jazz. This is in in many cultures. My school has a Turkish department, and in that music, it's the same way now. It becomes more ac ac academic through the school, but before it was just through oral editions, right? Somebody uh, oral tradition. Somebody played it, and a student copied it, and then this, the teacher would say. Yeah, that's not completely correct because you're playing this note a little bit too long or it should be a little bit higher. It's all learning each other phrases. And jazz is not diff it's no different. That's just a tradition of learning improvised music back in the day. ...of jazz, which then made people think that jazz sounds awful because they would hear people play these kind of lines. And they would play these lines in order to negotiate through chord changes. Now... When I became a teacher, my thing was, no, you play the sixth on the minor chord, on the two chord, because it's actually absolutely the best note you can play, right? If I play an A minor seven, I'm gonna play. Because that's the coolest note you can. But, but see, so here's, 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 it starts to me to get a little confusing because First, he said, okay, learn off records. And then when he started teaching, he was saying, no, play the six on the minor chord. I agree, that's a really pretty note. But then when he demonstrates it, he plays that note, and then he plays another great lick behind it. So what am I supposed to listen to? I'm supposed to listen to that one note? Or is it the whole phrase? Because if it's the whole phrase, then that six becomes kind of irrelevant. Then we're talking about a phrase. And that, that's here's where the confusing lies, and I understand it completely, because when I teach, I have the same... I have the same kind of uh, dualistic problems. That's not correct to say that, but I can't think of another way to say it. It's like you want to say something about the, the color of certain notes, but to demonstrate that, you have to play a complete phrase. And then it's actually the phrase that is the color. It's not the note. The note is part of that phrase. So then it would actually better be better to teach the phrase. But in that case, you could also just say to the student, you know what? The, um, I got this off this record of uh, Pat Metheny, something. Study that solo, or, or uh, next lesson, come with some phrasing that you like. But in the end, why would you need a teacher for that if you could just do that work yourself? Well, maybe you're not able to transcribe it. Uh, you need your teacher for that. But let's say you, you are, so why would you need a teacher then? It's, is he only there to point out what is nice on the recording? That seems kind of... Uh, strange to have a universe to go to university for that you can play on there okay if i'm playing an a minor seven chord a two chord hold on let me get it here I'm gonna, my I'm freeze gonna, is not freezing here okay let me see i was going to play until 10 30 yeah and then we're going to skip matter. um okay so I would play that six. I'd say, okay, you've got this A minor chord. So if you play... But see, in that lick is also the seven. It's like... So both the six and the seven are. If you want to make a point that the six is the prettiest note, then don't play the seven. Or is it both notes that are nice? I, th I think it doesn't really matter. It's about lick. This is a great lick. You want to talk about why this lick is great? I think it's because of the intervals. I, this is a lick that I play. Like I like to play that stuff, right on F minor, for instance. Play that sixth on there, which is the most dissonant note against the chord, or the furthest chord tone away from the root. If you think root third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, thirteenth. If you're building third, if you're building uh, stacking thirds, or you could just say no, it's D seven. We skip the A minor chords. It's D seven. It only becomes A minor seven if you also play the G, right? So if you really want to play a six on A minor and want to make it clear that you're thinking A minor, you have to play both the G and the F sharp. But if you just think D seven, even though the rhythm guitar might be playing A minor, if I just think C seven, uh, D seven. <laughs> 
then then there's there is this F sharp automatically. I don't have to think about nine, seven, uh, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. I just have to think about D7. I have the same effect. All right, there's the note. The 13th is the furthest note away in the overtone series, really, or in the chord structure, away from the tonic. Okay, so that's why. That's one of the reasons one. But the problem is that when you go to the five chord, if you play that 13th there, it gives away the sound of the D7 chord, the five chords. You're giving away the sound. And what they don't want you to do is they don't want you to give away that sound. Because if you give it away, it doesn't sound like you're making the changes. So then they would teach you licks like this. That would actually change to the downbeat on that third, okay? You can hear those kind of bebop lines like that, that emphasize that third on the downbeat, okay? So, uh, so really, the, the, because of this, because you had to come up with a curriculum to teach people, you had to actually write things down. And these are the kind of lines that people would write down, and they made students memorize them. And this became then the, the kind of how you ran kids through this mill and, and how, how universities would churn out musicians, okay? But very few of them actually learned how to play jazz or the, or play anything, you know? I mean, this this continues to go on. It's just kind of like when you go to school now and you're getting a degree in recording engineering, for example, there's no real recording engineer. I, I understand this point, but I do think actually that as many people learned did learn how to play uh, in schools. Maybe not even through the lessons, but just through meeting other musicians, having gigs and jamming. So there, there's certainly certainly some value or a lot of value to a school like that. But I don't agree with, like I hear that a lot, like all those schools, they turn out like samey sounding people. I don't know, it's a, this, a school has variants. They turn out some really good players, some average players, and, and maybe some uh, mediocre players. That's going to happen in every profession that you teach doesn't really matter. So I I'm certainly don't want to say that the method of learning licks is the best, best method. I do think it's the fastest, though, right? If you... I was thinking about that. when, If I have to teach somebody Dutch, right? You're not a Dutch... Uh, you don't speak Dutch, but you want to learn how to speak Dutch. I can teach you... And I can teach you something very fast. I can teach you, okay, you want to... You want to, I don't know, order something in a restaurant. I could teach you right now how to order this off the menu. And you might not understand all the words, but it's the fastest because you, you're going to have the food in 15 minutes. Or I can say, no, okay, first I have to teach you some grammar. Then I have to teach you uh, how to, um, I have to teach you the, the intonation and I have to teach you the exact pronunciation. And we have to look at some... Uh, some past tenses. I could make it a whole theoretical story. You're not going to have your food for another week, right? So that's why I think learning phrases is the fastest way. And in the end, I think the <laughs> I think the goal of learning the grammar is actually to play those phrases. So that's I'm I'm thinking why not just learn those phrases and start there, and then we can work on other things like how to make it swing, how to get the right sound. And then the creativity, because people say, no, but that kills creativity. If you learn, if you start learning licks, you become a lick machine. And um, it kills creativity. You start exactly like Stockholm. Well, I <laughs> once somebody told me once, like, I, I cannot join the Rosberg Academy because I don't want to be a Stockholm copy. But here's the thing. I said, if I would be a Stockholm copy at that, at that time, right, I would be very happy to hear myself because I know I can play them. <laughs> the creativity can come later. Once you... Once you can play, let's say, 50 tunes and you can sound good, it doesn't matter. You sound exactly like Django, amazing. You sound exactly like Borelli, amazing. You sound exactly like uh, Barney Kessel, great. Now is the time to start working on your own thing. But you have this basis of always being able to sound great, which you are not guaranteed by learning skills and 
theoretical devices, you have no guarantee of sounding good. You might sound good at one point, you might never sound good, you're never gonna know. I learned your one great sounding phrase, you're gonna sound good in five minutes, or, or however long it takes you to learn that phrase. Okay, I'm gonna skip a little bit in the video, and uh, we're gonna go to 13 minutes 30. or something, just to be weird, right? Um, so, but one of the problems with jazz, it's so difficult to learn. That's why people become snobs, because it's a lifelong pursuit. Because, for example, the first tune that I learned, I've said this in other videos, was Donna Lee by Charlie Parker. And the melody starts out like this. <laughs> That's the first lick in it. Okay, that's how it starts out then. That's just part way, that's a third of the way through the melody, right? So he's talking here for context, he's talking about why uh, jazz players become a little bit um, snobs, right? They, they start not having respect for musicians in other styles and he's He's trying to explain why that is, and then he takes it on the lead to say, because it's so difficult to play. So let, let's continue a little bit, because I have something to say about it. So, so I'm not even, I'm, now I'm about halfway through the melody. The melody kind of ends like this. And then, after you learn the melody, then you have to learn the chord progression before you can even solo and the chord progression. So the, my problem here is that he takes Dolan Lee to, to demonstrate how difficult jazz is. And yes, Dolan Lee theme is very difficult. <laughs> no doubt, I made a video about it if you want to learn the theme. It's very difficult. It's going to take you a lot of hours to make that sound good. But if you're honest, most jazz themes are very easy. Right? So I think... Taking Donna Lee as an example to prove how difficult jazz is to start with is not a very good idea because 95% of jazz themes are super easy. If you go to other music styles like bluegrass and uh, Brazilian shoto, those themes are very difficult. That is very difficult, but um, so it can, like that jazz musicians can be snobs, and I agree with that. It, that can be because of the difficult themes. That's not the reason. So. That is an illusion. It's not really true what he's saying here. I understand the point he's making, and I agree. Jazz musicians can be snobs. I've uh, encountered that myself, and maybe I, I am, a, I am a little my, I am, I can be like that as well. But I don't think it has something to do with the difficult themes. Although Dolan is difficult, I, I admit that. Question is this. So, uh, so now he's going to demonstrate the second reason. That's because the difficult chord progression. An A flat major seven. You see, and that's also, I mean, I understand the point, and I agree with the point. But of course, this is not Donald Lee. This is making Donald Lee very complicated by having lots of passing chords. <laughs> I mean, that's not how Donnelly goes, right? Donnelly is actually a pretty easy tune. The thing that makes it difficult at first is the key, maybe. But if we think about the song in G, it's actually super easy, right? It's G, and then it's a bunch of dominant chords in a row. E7, A7, and then D7, G. Oh, yeah, it's a 2-5. You could do A minor 7, D7, but we can just uh, do D7. So then it just becomes G. E7, A7, two bars even. D7, G to the four chords, right? So Don Lee itself is actually pretty easy and it's very easy to teach someone how to improvise on it, especially because it's a series of dominant chords. So you could just play the same lick. I'm not gonna say it's, it's a great improvisation, but it's easy to learn. I could just say, well, on E7, just play a diminished and then repeat it for A7 twice because it's two bars. Then do D7. Resolve to G, 
So Don Lee is actually a pretty easy tune. I don't think that cannot be the reason that jazz, become, jazz players become snobs. It's not because of the difficult themes, it's not because of the difficult progressions, and it's certainly not Don Lee progression because that's easy. <laughs> If you play like that, yeah, it's difficult. All these chords, right? It, it's crazy. And I'm, I'm about a quarter of the way through the song there. So what do you do with it? You're thinking, oh, man, how can I even improvise over that? And then every chord has its own scale. Not true, right? Uh, yeah, every chord has its own scale. But on guitar, it's exactly the same scale uh, because it's all dominant chords. And if you think in scales. And if you think in licks, it's, it's, you can play the same lick over and over. <laughs> I could be even easier. You could say, well, E7 and then A7, uh, or say E7 is the same as B flat 7, right? I, and you could show it on the guitar. Look at these two notes. I put this E in the bass, or I put the B flat in the bass. Same chord, different bass note. And you could say it's called a tritone substitute, but you don't have to say it. Stochelo knows uh, tritone substitutes. He doesn't know it's called a tritone substitute, but he does realize that these two chords are the same. So I could make it even easier. I could say G. And then you play a B7 lick, B flat 7 lick. And then you just shifted the flat down for A7. And then for A flat 7, which is the same as D7. Resolve, right? So improvising on Donnelly is easy because it's the same chord over and over. At the beginning, at least. Has its own arpeggio, you gotta learn all these things. So by the time you actually learn to improvise over this stuff freely, it's taken years, basically, right? Because it's because it's a language that you're learning. You're not going to go and learn German in a week, okay? Yeah, you can learn how to play a basic minor. You can learn German in a week. You're not going to learn it well, but just like I said, I can teach you the most essential things that you want to know about German in a week, right? Uh, what situation you're going to be in in a week? Oh, you're going to go. You're going to go see a concert. In, in that, um, so you have to buy a ticket, and then in, in the break you want to order a drink, and then you need to get the bus home. So I could teach you to order a ticket, that's going to be one sentence. Then I could uh, teach you how to order a drink, that's one sentence. And then I could teach you the sentence to uh, take the bus home, right? Or I could teach you how to read that. That's going to take... Uh, to teach it to you, it's going to take like two minutes, and then you have to practice maybe for like 15 minutes until it becomes somewhat understandable, and then you're fine for that occasion. And that's how I think about jazz. I, I think about tunes. Like, I want to learn jazz. Okay, start with the tune. Which tune do you want to learn? You want to learn Donnelly? I think that's a good tune to start with. I, I don't have no problem with Donnelly. The key is a little bit... Uh, it's not nice to talk in A-flat, so maybe let's do another tune. Or we could do uh, Indiana, which is the same as Don Lee, but it's in F. So it's a little bit easier to think about. Let's learn to play Don Lee. And that's also, now I'm going to promote my book, like just like Rick Piara does. That's also the point of my book. The book is to teach you to play one tune, which is an adapted version of minor swing. It's minor swing, but with uh, some two fives in there. So we have a two five one in major and minor. We're going to learn to play this tune at the professional level. So we start with knowing nothing. At the end, you'll be a, an expert at playing minor swing. You have an excellent basis now to do this with any other tune. And after you've done it for 10 tunes, the 11th one is going to be very easy until you encounter a tune that has some difficulties in it and you're going to spend some time. And then you're going to go on to the next tune. That's, a, I think, how you should also learn a language. And that's how a child learns a language, right? You just learn some sentences that can get you the food or you want some toy, so you learn that thing, or you, le you learn how to call your father, so you learn the word for father in, in, in your native language. Uh, he's not going to correct you, say, you know what, the, you, now you say the a singular, but you could also say it plural. I mean, why would you want to know that if there's no use for it? And that's everything I want to learn, everything's, every time somebody says to me, oh, why not learn this? Then the first question that I ask is, why? What are the practical results? If there's no good answer for it, then I'm not going to learn it. But maybe someone else has a good answer for it, right? I'm not saying that, that one person can um, influence my opinion forever. But if there's no good answer for it, then I'm not going to learn it. So if somebody says to me, you really got to learn your Dorian skill, which I don't know. I don't know any Dorian skill on the guitar. 
I know the major skill, but I only know the major skill in two positions. Um, then I would ask why, and then they would say, well, then you can play a Dorian modal tunes. I said, but I can already play Dorian modal tunes. So like, how do you do it? It's like, well, I learned Dorian, I don't call them Dorian, I, called, I learned really great licks from minor. Okay, so what else, what other benefits are there for me for learning the Dorian skill? I can't think of any, so I'm not going to learn the Dorian skill. I'm not saying that is the best way, but that's, that's the way I deal with learning how to improvise. Your pentatonic scale and play over blues, but you're not going to sound like B.B. King. You need a lifetime of pain to sound like that, you know? You need to have, there's so many nuances and things like that that are B.B. But you can actually, you can actually sound like B.B. King tomorrow, assuming you already play guitar. I'm not saying you're going to sound as good as B.B. King, but I... I, I can't because I don't know how B.B. King plays. But somebody can show you some signature licks and you can play those licks and you will sound like B.B. King at the moment you play them. You don't have to sound, you don't have the technique, you don't have the vibrato, but it's going to get you a whole lot closer to B.B. King than teaching you the pentatonic scale. Beyond uh, uh, something that you can just learn immediately, okay? I created my Beato book here. This thing is thick. Why? Because there's a lot of ideas in it. By the way, if you buy it, it comes as a PDF only. I printed it off. RB120. That's my shameless plug. That's actually the only way I make a living on here. That and if you buy my coffee mug. You now, people criticize him for uh, plugging his book, but <laughs> I hope you guys realize that he doesn't monetize his videos. So uh, I, do, I monetize my videos, but I'm not getting a lot of... Um, money from that but I have a patreon he doesn't have a patreon so the, all the work he puts into the videos how do you expect him to make a living right he has to make a living somehow so uh, selling the book is an option so I, I don't begrudge him for that at all right he he, he has to make he has to feed some um some mouths so so then, so then you say, okay, well, how do I learn how to play jazz then? And, and why, you know, what, if you don't learn the lick, well, how do you learn it then? Well, the, the thing is that you actually have to learn vocabulary somehow. You can't learn a language without learning sentences or how they're put together. And that's where the vocabulary of jazz comes. Now, it's far better than playing this. Now that's, that teaches you how to resolve to the third from the flat seven of the two chord to the third of the, of the uh, dominant chord, okay? But it doesn't really teach you phrases and phrases are really what, what makes, um, phrases are, are what makes people's playing have, uh, uh, have be interesting, okay? Bam, there you, there you go. <laughs> that, is, that is my main message. He's saying exactly here uh, what, what I'm saying. Phrases make you sound good. That's all there to it. There's all that there's to it. Yeah, you can sound bad playing nice phrases by having bad technique or bad timing. But we can talk about that. Like once you got the phrase down, let's talk about timing. Let's talk about sound. Let's talk about technique. But... Phrases are the fastest way, good, good phrases by good players are the fastest way to sound good. He, he's saying that exactly here. Now, but he's going to contradict that point a little bit. But that's just because that's the difference between being a player and being a teacher. It's very difficult to get away from the teaching methodology that is already there, right? Because why would you need lessons to... For this, I could just, and that's why when I teach somebody through Skype, it's, I can do it with one lesson. I could just say, okay, what do you want to learn? Oh, you want to play, you want to learn how to play rhythm changes? Who do you like? Oh, are you like, uh, you like Joe Pass? And then I can point them maybe to some rhythm change that Joe Pass played and some other players that sound like it. And then say, go transcribe it. And then uh, contact me again if you have some questions about some of the phrases. But that can be months later. The, he doesn't need weekly lessons for that, right? So... I understand what is happening in, in I think, I don't, I don't know what Rick is thinking, but I, I can understand this difficulty between realizing that phrases are the key, but also needing to, be, needing to teach something. And it's also what people desire. People don't, 
Like sometimes I wonder why my channel is not growing really fast, right? My channel, I'm doing something really wrong because I have m way more than 300 videos and I only have 24,000 subscribers. Somebody like uh, Tim Pierce has, I think, 264 videos, something like 280, and he has almost 300,000 subscribers. I think what I'm doing wrong after thinking about it is I am, all my videos are about, okay, here's something that you can now practice for half a year. And then five days later, I make another video that is exactly like this. Like, okay, here's another thing you can practice for half a year. And that's not what people want to consume all the time. People like to sit back and think, oh, Dorian's skill, right? Okay. Oh, it has a flat seven and a six. And that's why it sounds so great. Okay. I understand that. That's just easier to consume and it makes people feel good. And I understand it completely. Instead of like a jerk like me saying, okay, now practice this for, 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 for eight hours and then try playing it on a backing track. And it's going to be very difficult. It's, it, I'm not saying it's easy, right? Learning the phrases, it's still going to be difficult. You're still going to practice, have to practice four hours a day if you want to have any chance of sounding good within three years. Okay, now I want to skip uh, to 1910. By the way, if uh, do you know that you can uh, scroll through YouTube videos with the num number pad? So when you press one, it goes to 10% of the video, to 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. Zero beginning, like just a tip. Okay, so we have to go to 1910. And then with the arrow keys, you can skip uh, five seconds. So 1910, here we go. Let's do five seconds before. Dominant chord. This, these type ideas really come from the circle of fifths. I have a video on here called the, 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 the cycle of fifths, I think I call it. But I, I, I play through a series of dominant chords. <laughs> Right there, I'm just keep going. I'm just going, you know, like. Um... Okay, so when I saw him do this in the video, I was like, first of all, I cannot do that at all. And, and I know he can do that uh, for a long time because I, there's another video where I demonstrate this and this goes, goes on forever and all over the guitar neck. It demonstrates how well he knows his the fretboard. And then he recommends practicing that and I understand the value of it, but like I understand the value of, of it as a tool to learn the fretboard. But like in music, why would I want to be able to do this? Like, what is the reason? So I was thinking about this. Like, what could be the reason for me to learn this endless cycle of five chords, right? So G7, C7, C, uh, G7, C7, F7, B7, flat seven, E7, flat seven, A7, flat seven, F sharp 7. And you go on and on. And then you just, you play that same phrase all over the neck. And you, you skip octaves and stuff. You can, it's a cycle. You can go on forever. So the only reason I can think of to learn it, because I, I want to think about a tune, right, is, is um, Jordu, which is a Clifford Brown tune. Because Jordu, um, that's a tune that goes like a... Right, so that has a bridge that goes like... So the bridge goes like. So exactly the cycle, but it stops at D flat. And then we have the same cycle starting on F7. So that is a tune that is that could be helpful. But then I'm thinking, do I want to play this at the cycle? You know what? Let's check with some. Um, let's check with some legends. So today I checked Barney Kessel. So Barney Kettle plays, plays this. Or he does it like this. So he's playing a minor chord, D minor 6 on G7, and then a diminished chord on C7. And he just repeats it in different rhythms. 
and then resolve. Right? And he does it in both choruses. So it's something he practiced, right? So he's not playing that cycle. Then I check the original recording with Clifford Brown. Now Clifford Brown plays genius lines there. But then Harold Lent, the saxophone player, he actually plays. Uh, but then he goes to. He goes to a scale. Then I checked uh, Oscar Peterson, and he, Oscar Peterson plays something. And then I checked Peter Bernstein. Peter Bernstein plays. Uh, let's see. Something like that. Very interesting lines. But there's, you can see there's almost no cycles. It, those are like grandmasters. And I, I promise you, you can go on and on. You will never find anyone that actually plays those cycles. So why would I practice that? Because it's the only tune I can think of using it. And then I wouldn't even use it because there's so many more interesting things to play. And I was thinking just before the stream started, like if you could also just do a Django thing, just play chords. I mean, it's a guitar, right? Why, don't, why not just play? Why not play that? Or... Uh, so G7. There's so many possibilities on guitar, like with chords. Uh, all these nice chords that you can play, uh, or these messages you can transcribe, I don't understand the purpose of learning the cycles, apart from the purpose itself, so you can demonstrate the cycles. So I have a lot of admiration for the fact that people can actually do it, but I don't really understand it. Um, same, I saw a video by, which I'm going to react to one of his videos too. I saw a video by uh, Levy Clay, who is a, a pretty well-known transcriber. He transcribed a lot of stuff and he's, he's very knowledgeable about the guitar. And he was demonstrating that he knows every inversion of a triad on every string set, even with skipped strings. And it, and it was not like this, like... No, it was like this. And I was like amazed. And he was, I think he was doing it while talking. That must have taken him hundreds of hours to be able to do it that fast, that accurately. B but the thing is, what purpose does it serve? I, I know maybe there is a purpose that I don't understand. And that could very well be. So I'm not saying here that it is purposelessness, that there is no purpose. But I don't, I don't know what it is. And it's going to take me hundreds of hours to do it. Why not learn a, a Clifford Brown solo in those I could learn probably five Clifford Brown solos in that time and assimilate some of the phrases in there. Okay, let, let's skip to 2050. Uh, lines of where all these resolutions are on the guitar. So one of the reasons that, that jazz players, to, you know, when you actually have to sit down and study this stuff for years, people get really myopic. They, they get focused in on one thing because it takes a long time. If you play a chording instrument, you've got twice the work than a saxophone oh, yeah. player has, for example, that's playing only one note at a time, sometimes two notes at a time. But with then on the guitar you have to learn all the chords too right so you learn okay what a minor seven what are my inversions d7 or d7 flat nine the, there's okay first the thing about the saxophone players i I understand this point, like saxophone players don't have to learn chords and stuff, but to be honest, the level of saxophone players as solo players generally is much higher than the level of guitar players. That's because they just spend more time on learning how to play solos. And you also probably have to be a better saxophone, saxophone player to get gigs than a guitar player. I'm not saying that you that you can be bad as a guitar player, but compare or look at the, um, look at the Nat King Cole trio. Right, you had Nat King Cole singing, of course, but you had Nat King Cole playing piano like a god, and you had um, 
the guitar player, I forgot his name, who, play, who played nice, but it's of course not the level of Nat King Cole. And the reason for that is that before Nat King Cole, you had Art Tatum. The level of the level of the instrument is dictated by the history of musicians. So the level of saxophone players is so high because they spend more time on soloing. So I don't think that you can say that the guitar player has to do twice the amount of work just because the, the level of soloing on average for guitar players is lower. Of course, there's like um, exceptions for, for genius guitar players, but on average, when you go to a gig and there will be a, there's a guitar player and a saxophone player in the band, I'm gonna put my money down that in 70% of those cases, the saxophone player will be a better solo player than the guitar player. That's just because of the culture. Now, then he's demonstrating all those inversions. And again, I'm always um, in awe of all those guitar players that can play all those inversions. And it's a common practice, right? There's also Pasquale Grasso videos where he shows very fast all those inversions he knows. And, but, <laughs> but, but then, so, so, okay, that's amazing. Maybe I should learn that. But then you watch him comp and he's actually using only some of these inversions, like, or very little of them. Yeah, when he plays a solo guitar plays piece, there's many inversions, but those are arranged. You, you, you didn't have to know all these inversions to play that, you, because it's practiced. So why would I learn all inversions for A minor if I am better off l use, uh, learning the inversions or learning the chord shapes? I don't talk about inversions. That sounds nice. Okay, this one sounds nice. Right? Oh, this one sounds nice. 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 That one sounds nice. That one sounds nice. And the way I found these is not through inversions. This is just because I heard it on recordings or someone else taught me around the campfire. <laughs> Or I saw it uh, during jamming. It's like, oh, what is that chord that you just played? I said, that chord? Oh, that's, uh, it's this, right? And then I program another chord shape in my hands. And uh, there was some criticism on jazzguitar.be for making that suggestion that you learn the best chords from other players just by somebody showing you. That seemed to be narrow-minded. Why, why not search for your own voicings? Yeah, I'm, do whatever you want, but... It's just reinventing the wheel. Now you might come up with something uh, brand new, but if I hear this, you know, I got that from Robin Nolan. Of course, he got it from someone else. I saw that, and it, it's a common sound, but. And then he showed me, it's like, it's this. And I have a really nice thing for A minor, right? Um, why would I wait until I maybe accidentally find this by practicing some inversions or counterpoint when there's somebody there that just played for me and it sounds great, why shouldn't I ask them, like, hey dude, what did you just play there? Because we, I know we were jammed together and we were doing that all the time. It's like, what did you just play there? And then I showed them my thing, right? And then I hear Jungle play, what the difference a day makes. Um, oh, how did it go? Da, 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 ba, da, da. He plays, da, da. Comping, right? It's like I had to stop the recording because it sounds like he just plays this big F chord. It's like A minor, F, and then D with a, an inversion. Oh, my guitar's out tune. And then he shifts up this diminished shape. So why would I wait until I accidentally find this? And I can tell you right now, I would never find that. I would never find this. Never. I, I can't see any scenario that I would find that. So I got it from a recording. That's all. And everything. I, every time I play something nice, I, uh, for instance, this nice two five one by Peter Ber uh, Peter Bernstein. It's like two five one for for D. Two three four one to right. Two five one to D. Here we go. How am I gonna find that by practicing inversions? I found that because I just transcribed it off a Peter Bernstein recording. That's how it goes. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, we're at, yeah, a little bit further. So many different things to learn, For then you have to learn about comping.
I think I did, I, had, I was making the same point here. So let's skip to last part that I want to talk about. 30 through 20. Yeah, and this is about a comment he got. And that's, uh, let's, he's, he's going to read the comment. Because he's now he's just uh, having a conversation with the audience. The lesson stopped. And then there came this comment and he reads it. And last Harmony video avail available is a I PDF that are beato guide. It's uh, uh, but uh, um, really interesting. Uh, in in so I never talk about punk rock, but I played in a punk rock band in college. Thank you, Alex, very much. Licks killed jazz and popular jazz stars, and their and their style killed individuality of, of a lot of young musicians. Boom. Better said than I could ever say it. Yes. Okay. Let me repeat that comment. He just got a comment. That said, let me see if we can find it in the, his comment section. I don't think I can find it. Okay, let's 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 hear him say it again. Did my love for jazz ever make me shun popular blues? Talk more. Did something thing that had you know? I was in in college. Thank you, Alex, very much. Licks killed jazz and popular jazz stars and their and their style. Licks killed jazz and popular jazz stars and their styles. Killed individuality of, of a lot of young musicians. <laughs> Boom. Better said than I could ever say it. Yes, yeah, Steely Dan, I saw that too. Bands like that. Uh, um, licks rob people of their originality. That's why I don't like to, I don't like memes. About so isn't that a contradiction with the beginning in which he said that to learn jazz, you have to learn phrases. Or is it because of the word phrases and licks? Is maybe for uh, for Rick and many other people, because I've heard this many times before, that's why I started using the word phrases more. right? Because I, I think about them as licks. But um, I noticed that when I say phrases, I, I, get, I got less resistance. Somehow people are fine with the word phrases, but not with the word licks. But for me, they're the same thing. And... I don't believe in this kills individuality because that would only happen if you would only be influenced by one person, only one person for your for the whole for the entirety of your uh, mu music musician career. Right? If I would be only influenced by Stochlo, which I was for a long time, but there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you don't keep that up for the rest of your life, because then yeah, you're gonna sound like a second-rate copy of someone else. Or, or maybe you become better than that someone, but it's still, you're going to sound like that someone on steroids. But that's not going to happen because you're going to be influenced, especially today, because it's so easy to get influences. You're going to influence by many artists in, their, in different styles and, uh, or maybe the same artists in different um, periods of their life is got, are going to sound completely different. So... It doesn't rob you of your creativity or of your originality because you're going to be an amalgamation of all these influences and you start combining them and transforming them and then you will sound like you. I think I sound like me, even though you can stop me at any moment in a solo and I could tell you, okay, oh yeah, this I got this idea from Peter Bernstein, Django, Stockel Rosenberg, uh, Wes Montgomery, Grant Green, Uva Kenius, uh, Sonny Rollins... Pasquale Grasso, like all these people that I talk about on my channel, they all influence me in some way, some more than others. But in the end, I'm going to play something that none of that of them have ever played because they have different influences. Now, it could go even further. If you are a guitar player and your only influence is a piano player, like some people say, okay, Pasquale's biggest influence is Bud Powell. But that's why he sounds original, because now we hear all these Bad Powell things on guitar we've, we've never heard before. So it's even possible to be influenced by one person and sound completely original. A good example of that is Vati Rosenberg, who is an amazing violin player from the Rosenberg family. He was mainly influenced by Stocholo. So he plays those Stocholo licks on violin, and they sound completely original on violin. Now, he has other influences after that, um, of course, Capelli, uh, but also uh, Flori Niculescu. So, lots of other stuff has creeped in, but in the beginning, it sounded exactly like Stochola on violin, and it sounded great. So, 
I don't believe in this statement of uh, robbing people from the originality. In fact, I think you have more of a chance of becoming a relevant original by studying the tradition that you like. And I'm, I'm not even going to say you, uh, when you study Gypsy Jazz, you got to study Django. No, no, study what you like. Because if you don't study what you like, if you, if you don't uh, study the people that you like, then you probably get bored or frustrated. So please stick to the things that you like. That's why um, my channel has such a variety of different artists that I'm influenced by, because I all, I, all, I all like these people. So I never stick to, okay, I'm only going to do this period of Charlie Parker. No, no. I want to do this solo of Charlie Parker. I want to do that solo of, of other people. Uh, this style doesn't really matter. If I like something, I did a, a video about Tim Pierce which is a pop guitar player, but he had some really cool minor stuff that I just wanted to be to, to check out, right? Okay, that's it. So now I'm gonna uh, scroll through the comments and um, I'm gonna answer all text questions. And I can see that because the comments light up red for me. I don't know how it looks for you, but these I answered. Hans Peter Lidesse says, wait, he's going to talk about licks or the luck? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, he called it the lick. Um, that's just, I think, a clickbait title. Uh, that's uh, People like to see videos about the lick. So he does talk a little bit about the lick that he doesn't like, uh, th that people are memeing, making memes like that, because it kind of degrades the art form of jazz by showing that everybody plays the same lick. And then it becomes, people start thinking that jazz is all about licks, <laughs> which it is. I think, but okay, um, I understand this point. So uh, he was just talking about leaks in general. Paul Lubson asks, if you were a cynic, you could think that Rick suddenly remembered that he has to sell his other book, which is Scales of Chords. Yeah, I, I can see that point, though I don't want to, um, I don't want to be negative about learning music theory. Uh, I, it sounds Sometimes it sounds, also when I hear myself talk, like I, I hate music theory, which is, is definitely not the case. I think I'm I think I'm an expert on it. If you don't believe that, watch my video about arranging for strings. It's called arranging for strings, and it's very theoretical. But the reason is because, as an arranger, I have a very theoretical energy of arranging. It's all about theory. I was teaching a violin uh, workshop or masterclass or whatever you want to call it the other day for Matt Holborn. Matt Holborn is a jazz violin player. He has a Patreon and he said, okay, when I get 30, I will have a guest teacher. So I did a, a guest appearance on violin. My approach is much more theoretical. Not as theoretical, still not as theoretical as uh, a lot of jazz teaching that you see, but it's more theoretical. Why? Because violin players tend to think in note names, all of them, right? Guitar, yes, some, some people do, but most people don't. Uh, but violin, yes, everybody thinks about note names. That's just how you learn the instrument. It's easy to think like that. So I talk a lot about note names. I talk about arpeggios. I talk about uh, sus this, major seven that. That's the way I teach violin. But I don't want to be negative about music theory. And some people really like to study music theory. I think if you like to study music theory, then probably the Beata book, I, I haven't read it, it's probably very good, like... Uh, going by uh, his uh, videos. He knows a lot about theory. It's, it seems like he has infinite, infinite knowledge about music theory. So, yeah, uh, why not learn music theory that way? That might be good. So I think I, I talked about that dualistic thing, like where you we realize, okay, to learn jazz, it's best probably to transcribe and, and, and learn phrases. But, yeah, yeah I also teach music theory. That's a difficult situation to be in. Okay, let's go on. Hans-Peter I'm going to say Hans-Peter. Why do you want to compete and compare? If you need to make much money, just not the way. Is it to me? Why do you want to compete and compare? If you need to make much money, just not the way. Maybe it's not about me. Maybe it's just about something in the video. But I, I do agree. If you want to make a lot of money, just not, not the way. Definitely not the way. I can, 
I can uh, I can relate. Uh, Steve Angelilli asks, will your book be available in electronic format? Good question. The electronic format, the PDF or ebook, was in fact only for my Indiegogo backers because they were the ones that made it possible to make the book. And that was their, their benefit, right? Like, okay, if you support me blindly because there was nothing to, to look at, there's no, no preview, nothing, because I had to still write it. Then you get both the ebook and the physical book. I think by now everybody got their physical book and the ebook. So the the ebook will be eventually will be available again. But for now, it's only for the Indiegogo backers, and we have like a thousand books. Well, we sold a bunch of them now, but <laughs> they have to sell out first uh, before we uh, before I actually switch to ebook, and that can be a year or two. So if you want to order them in the US, it's djangoguitars.com. I think there's a link in the description. If you want to order them in Europe, send a mail to Heymert, that's my last name, academy at gmail.com with subject from the Heymert System book, and you'll be contacted, and um, then you'll get a book. That works really great. Uh, I'm going to make a live stream about my book in the near future and talk a little bit more about it. Can you let us know when your next live stream will be about and what you will roughly roughly talk about so I can note them down to watch it? I think I will make a live stream every week. It will be about another video and I'm, I'm not sure what the next one will be. I was thinking about reacting to Tim Pierce's video about what it is what it's like to be a professional musician in these days, in this uh, pandemic, or as a YouTuber. That's interesting, but there's also a bunch of other videos. And also, if, if there's a video that you think is interesting for me to watch and react to, uh, send me, um, put it in the comments uh, under the video uh, or just any any video actually, because I uh, maybe the last, the last video is up right now. You can put a comment like, I saw this video and then I can comment on that. So I can't really say which video and also not when. Probably will be uh, like Monday or Tuesday. Oscar Moore, I see. That's the, yeah, great. That's the guitar player on the net can go. Paul Lubson, I'm not negative on theory. I'm just claiming that the desire to sell a theoretical book makes him incoherent. So learn licks at one moment, then theory recommendation. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Um, that's what I'm saying. Like the, 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 the disparity between realizing how to learn jazz and also being a teacher of music theory is difficult for everyone luckily i don't teach theory so i don't have the problem would you tell us more about the barry harris month program yeah so i'm transcribing or i have transcribed uh, two solos by barry harris now it's going to be four so i have how high the moon i already made a video about that uh, it's on my channel i think i have rhythm changes and then i'm, I'm going to do two more and it's just going to be the same thing as always. I'm going to uh, teach you the complete solo, then make a video with the best phrases and maybe do a rhythm thing, although it's different songs, so maybe not. Um, maybe i do a live stream reacting to the Barry Harris video, something like that. Um, what I'm not going to do is teach the th theoretical framework that Barry Harris has because I don't know anything about it so it would make no sense to teach it and also I'm not interested in it because again although I said last time I really appreciate what he has done because he created a framework so we can so people can talk about what is happening in jazz without re having to refer to classical music which I think is is the best thing that can happen uh, for music theory because if we talk about jazz theory we have to talk about it on its own terms is that there's no point in trying to compare it to music theory that uh, comes from Bach right why would we do that Bach didn't write jazz so I like that a lot uh, but like learning theory to learn how to improvise even if it is a very um, very condensed and very helpful it's just not my way I'm a transcriber and I learn through phrases like so I'm going to do the same thing. And the reason I'm doing the Barry Harris month is just 
because I want to dive into his language for my Bibo book. Only criticism on the hard copy book is the tap notation is tiny. I need to put the book right in front of my face. Oh, yeah. I heard it a couple of times. Um, yeah, that's. I think maybe the tap might be a little bit too small. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> it's, it's probably because I made it on a big screen, right? So I have put everything on a A4 and it looked great on my screen. But printed, it might seem too small. Although some people have told me it was fine. For other people, it's a little bit too small. But it is definitely readable. And also... The tab is also on the screen when I um, talk in the videos, although that is small as well. It is not, I wouldn't say it's tiny, but it's definitely not, it could have been bigger, I, I admit to that. Uh, but some people say to me, oh, it's only 28 pages, but I want to set the record straight. The book is not the main thing. The main thing is the videos. It's the videos which are very comprehensive, and the book is just the tab from the videos and summaries and something to remind you of what is happening in the videos. That's why the book is only 28 pages. If I would have written everything in the book that's in the videos, the book would be very big. So that's, I didn't choose that route. There's something called the lick. It's a jazz meme. Yeah, I know that. I made a video about it. Check it out. We don't really know where, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, Hans Peter Lidesso says, uh, with this way of doing live chat, we don't really know where it's going. Questions maybe no may no longer be relevant when you get them. That's true. That I your question above was probably referring to something that I forgot. But there's no other way for me to do it because I cannot look at the video to react to and the chat at the same time. That would be very um, jarring if I would switch all the time. So uh, sometimes I might not realize what's what it is referring to. But if you watch other live streams, it's, it is always like that. It's just. That's just the way it goes. I, I, can't, I, re I can't really change that. Uh, I see your Barry's theory come from Chopin least. Well, uh, I'm not sure that is the case. I don't think Chopin least ever talked about jazz, and Barry is specifically talking about jazz. Um, I think I heard him say once it's a continuation, right? But the continuation doesn't necessarily mean that it uses the same principles because I don't think you could use the scale of four chords to analyze a least prelude or it, it would make no sense right because least was not using that framework to write his music and um, but Paul is not using or Charlie Parker was not using the framework of Bach to improvise jazz solos so if we talk about lines and we talk about pivoting which is something that uh, Barry talks about then we're really talking about jazz so even though it's a con continuation of something else, which is, of course, you could say that about everything because it uses the same language, then um, I, wouldn't, I would never say that it comes from Lise and Chopin. I would give all the credit in this case to Barry Harris and for coming up with it. That's his thing. I don't think it's... it's but, you know, I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I, I tend to look at it like that. Do you like the Gypsy Altamir Gypsy Model MT? Yes. I have one. Uh, I have it downstairs. Right here I have a model um, TD, which is a great guitar, really good professional guitar. But the model M is a professional guitar as well. It does, doesn't look as nice. And it has a little bit less of a rich sound, but it has a good sound. And I could easily do a gig on it if there were gigs, but there's no gigs. And I play on it every day. So when people ask me about a Gypsy Jazz guitar, the first one to get, it's definitely the model M. It's cheap, it's $700 or euros, and it's a great guitar. There's no other guitar in that price range that is as good as that guitar. The guitar was designed by Tommy Davey, and if you know Tommy Davey, this guy knows <laughs> what it takes to get a good guitar. So you can trust it, just for that reason alone. But also, just ask Dennis Cheng, uh, me, but a bunch of other players. Uh, who, who else got one recently... I think Jimmy Grant plays, plays one, uh, but there's a bunch of people that play on it and they all love it. Do you ever get confused with when changing the guitar because of dot mark? Yeah, good question. So uh, even Margovic asked me if I ever get confused with the dot being on nine on a art stop and 10 on a Gypsy's guitar. And I can tell you, yes, in the beginning I did. Uh, and 
it was it was terrible. I would be jamming and I was like, ah, oh, I played some wrong wrong fret, you know, because I, I played art stop so much. But now um, it's completely gone. And I know why. I just found some way in my head to make to change that or something. Maybe I'm ignoring this fret, I don't know. I never worked on it um, consciously, but for some reason now I never make this mistake again and it never bothers me that it's nine here and ten on the gypsy's guitar. So apparently when you just do it enough, your mind starts connecting the dots, pun intended, uh, the correct way. But for instance, uh, I had the experience with Stocholo. That's a funny story. We were playing a festival and then he, was, uh, he didn't bring his own guitar, so he got a guitar and it was a howl. It was a beautiful howl. Uh, set up by Tommy Davy, I remember, but it had a dot on nine, and Stockholm is fine with the dot on nine. It's 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 fine with him. He's not used to it, but you know it, it normally makes no difference. But then during the rehearsal, he made two mistakes, and he freaked out because there was a big concert, and he didn't want to play the guitar anymore. He said, "I can't do it. I cannot take this risk of making the mistake." And then Tommy Davy uh, managed to move the fret <laughs> marker, so he could still use the guitar. But yeah, it's a diff it's difficult. What do you think of copying licks from instruments other than your own, like a trumpet lick on guitar? Yeah, that I do that all the time. I may have many videos about it. Um, I, have a, I have a video about Clifford Brown. I play all his licks on guitar. I have a video about Sonny Rollins. I have a video about Jerry Mulligan. I have several about Jerry Parker. I have videos about, I think many, uh, our piano players, Oscar Peterson, um, Different instruments all the time, and that's great because, I mean, a good lick is a good lick. Doesn't matter which instrument it is. So, guys, thank you so much for being here. It was a great stream. I think at one point I had like 130 people, which is uh, really unusual for me to have during a live stream. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say good night, and I will see all of you next week. Please, if you have uh, recommendations for. Uh, videos for, for me to react to. I mean, there's so many videos on YouTube. I can't watch them all. Let me know. Put a, a comment under this video. It will be on my channel or the, the last live stream. And then I will take a look at it. And um, thank you for being here. And I'll see you all next time. Bye. <laughs>